See, we're, we're so used to doing things uh, in, in a certain way. I, I, believe, I believe God will, will bring us to a place where we're so dependent on Him. Even in services and, and, and just the way we live, um, there, there's, a, there's a place that I, I believe we need to come to that we're... When we come together on Sunday, we are coming together to fulfill our priestly duty together. It's, it's a very holy thing to come together on Sunday. And um, by and large, the church worlds, in, in the low waters of non-revival times, people go through the Sunday thing as just a matter of rote. It's time to show up for Sunday morning so you get dressed and sometimes you think, oh gee whiz, I wish the weather, you know, I wish we got snowed in. I'd, I'd rather not go anywhere. And so, you know, you clench teeth and okay, well, I'll show up. I gotta do my thing, you know, you know so that Salve my conscience, you know, and, and uh, but God wants to bring us to a place to where hunger for him totally consumes everything. And, um, you know, I mean, we see from the scriptures, uh, Pastor was saying this morning, too, that, that uh, you know, just, just a passing comment about, you know, nobody fell out the window this morning. But you remember Paul, when he preached, he was, he was going to be in just for a little bit. He, he, came, he came through and he ministered, and he ministered long. Not for the sake of being long, and I don't want to go long. Maybe, you know, uh, I'm going to try to fit more into the American mold. Uh, maybe, you know, Lord willing. <laughs> Miracles can happen. But, um, but it's, it's interesting because Paul, when he, when he was passing through town, he ministered long enough where a young man fell out the window. <laughs> and, uh, you know, of course, you know, he, he falls out of, you know, you know, uh, second or, you know, story, whatever it was, window, and, he, was, he, and, and uh, he ends up dead in the ground. Some people would say, well, that'll, that'll learn you for falling asleep on the preacher. No, 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 it wasn't. I mean, it was, it was, it was a harmless thing. He just, he just picked a bad place to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you can sleep in, in, in safer places than, than, than on a window ledge. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so anyway, bad, bad timing, bad choice. Um, Paul went down and just landed on the young man. And, um, you know, sometimes, sometimes it's not even, a, you know, we're, we're, we're so used to formula. But I believe we come to a place in God to where we can just live out that life. And just what needs to be, must be, and it will be. And we're, not, we're not busy with formulas because we know God and in the flow of things, it just has to work. Yeah. Uh, now, what I'm, I'll tell you what I'm talking about. Paul, it doesn't even say what he did, what he prayed. There wasn't a formula, you know, did he pray a certain way? How did he raise that young man from the dead? He just landed on him, and just like the prophet in the Old Testament, just, just like, like, like Elijah, you just knew that, that whatever he was praying, this young man is getting up. That's all there is to it. I think that's the way it was when, when, when he himself was raised up. Do you ever remember when, when they stoned Paul? They left him for dead. I think it's one of the most remarkable passages. They, 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 uh, these guys that stoned him, these guys are professionals. <laughs> if a muscle twitches after the last stone is thrown, you know, here comes another 20 stones. And so these, these guys, when they drug him out of town, I mean, they were well convinced that he was dead. I mean, there wouldn't have been a chance. I mean, you, you, can't, you can't fool these guys and pretend you're dead. You know, and, and, and so they left him for dead. And all it says in, in chapter 14 of Acts is that the believers gathered around him. Doesn't say that they sang kumbaya. Doesn't, sang, doesn't say that they prayed a certain way or, or confessed a certain way or, or whatever. It didn't say. It was enough yeah. that believers gathered around. And this, too, must end up in victory. This is sort of a weird situation because, you know, the, the, the thing is sort of fresh for me. Because I remember, I remember it was at the end of a meeting one time. And, uh, and what happened was, was there was this young man, this is years ago, uh, just playing on the platform. You, you, you know, we had a very high stage in the place we were renting the very first time. We rented this, this community hall as a culture center before we ever had a building. Sat up, or, you know, set up the equipment and tore down every meeting, you know, and, and, and brought the equipment in, set it up every meeting, tore it down after every meeting. I mean, thank God for the faithfulness of these, these people that were willing to do that. See, there, you know, I don't know if you've noticed this, but in, in Nehemiah, in chapter 3, it talks about all the people that, you know, and such and so built up this part of the wall and worked alongside such and so, and they put the posts and the lintels in place, the lintels in place, and they built up this, and, the, and, 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 and just, just a, a detailed running commentary of who did what. 
And it even said, and such and such people, you know, these people, they were not willing to put their hand to the work. And, and don't kid yourself for a moment. Every bit as accurate a record is being made right now as we live concerning the things we do and don't do. Because there's two books. You, you notice at the end of Revelation, there's two books. There's the book of life, but there's also the book that record the works. Are you here? Yeah. Say, oh me or oh my. Or both. <laughs> or both. You know, and it's not too late because, see, see Jesus, he, 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 you know, the, the, the person that comes to work at the end of the day, but he yeah, sets his heart to it, he, he gets the same reward. So, so misgivings in the past is not a reason to sort of wonder, well, it's too late now. No, it's never too late. It's, it's only too late when it's actually too late. But as long as, as long as you're here and can respond to the word of God, we can give it our all. And see, you ever notice that even with Abraham, uh, he, was a, he, was, he was the friend of God. But if you read the, the account in Genesis, you, you, you go, dear Lord in heaven, I don't know one Christian that would make the type of mistakes he made. Choosing plan B with, with, with Hagar. You think, man, that's pretty severe. And, and, and all, the, all the crazy stuff in the Middle East today is because of that mistake. Because that's where the, that's where the whole Arab race came. And, and, and you know, the whole, the whole national... And, and, and from all through the, the, the years, all through the, the centuries, there's always been the, 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 the tension between the natural... Or, I mean, between, between Isaac and, and, and between Ishmael. Are you here? You know, and, and you think all the mistakes that he made, he didn't look like a great man of faith. He, he, he even said to the Lord, you know, he says, Lord, let's, uh, let, let, this go, let, this go through, let this go through Ishmael. You know, and he was ready to back off. He was ready to, you know, but when you read Hebrews, you think, man, this guy was a man of faith. There was no record of all that. There was no record of it because it was removed. You'd figure the guy was perfect until you go read Genesis. You go, oh man, man, this, this guy, this guy. How did the account get written in Hebrews? It, I'll tell you why. It's because God can forgive. And what remains is what remains before the Lord. Some people don't ask for forgiveness. You ever noticed even with Job? There's one very peculiar line that, that uh, you know, God says that you three have not spoken right of me as my servant Job has. You ever re read that and you wonder, what? I mean, Lord, did, did you just hear? I mean, what happened between chapter 3 and chapter uh, 37? Did, did you not read what Job said? You surely. So what is this speaking right as my servant Job did? Well, see, the thing is that when Job said, woe is me, I have spoke of matters that I don't understand. I mean, he repented. And all that was left was an amazing life. You want to you see what kind of a man Job really was? Read chapter 29 and 30 and 31. And sometimes it's a little fuzzy. I read the King James myself, but sometimes the language can be fuzzy. <clears throat> you know, um, it's, 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 uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very accurate translation, but sometimes just because it's, a, you know, there's, there's archaic words in there, sometimes you don't get certain things, it may be accurate, but read it in another translation and compare it with the King James or whatever, but, but read those three chapters and see what kind of a man he was. And I, and, I, and I ask you, I challenge you, do you know of a Christian today or in the last 50 years or anybody you've ever met or heard of that, that has lived the type of life that Job did? Personally, the guy was amazing. And you know, Ezekiel 14, 14, Jeremiah 15, 2, or 15, 1, there's, there's a very peculiar passage that says, even if these men were here, they would save only themselves because of the level that Israel had, that had fallen to. It, in one case, it mentions, it mentions Moses and Samuel. In another case, it mentions Noah, Daniel, and Job. Don't ever think that God doesn't see who's living beautifully before him. When I say beautifully, I mean with a beautiful heart, a perfect heart. Yeah. 
See, Hebrews 5 and verse 7, it says, And Jesus, he cried out with loud cryings and tears unto the one that could save him to death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission, or, or Pete, as it says in one translation. I don't know if you ever thought of this. You know, we, we, we talk about faith coming through hearing, hearing through the word of God, and that's absolutely the truth. But there's another way that faith comes too. 1 John 3, verse 21 and 22. If we do those things that please him, let's, let's turn here for a minute. Because we're talking about presence, prayer, and protocol. Three very important words as we go on to the completion of the end of this age. We cannot navigate the days of the end of this age with human wisdom. GPS is just like a natural, just a little bit of a taste of what we need from God. You go into some huge city without GPS and you go, I'm lost. I'm lost. I went to Dusseldorf one time, and I was thinking, oh, I've, I've got it. I, I've been to this guy's place a time or two, and, and I'll, find, I'll find where he lives. It's just a maze of one-way streets, and nothing. there's no grid pattern anywhere. Forget the grid pattern. I don't know if our sister from Germany is still here. I don't know where she's from. But in any case, uh, so, I mean, it, it was really amazing. And so I thought, oh, I'll find this place real easy. And so I, I, I go in there, and I'm thinking, I'm thinking, why am I not finding this place? And, and at eight bucks a gallon or eight and a half bucks a gallon, I was circling around, and, and, and I was just, and, I was, and, and with every passing five minutes, I was going, I can't believe this is happening to me. And I, I killed almost an hour of gasoline and time, and I still couldn't find the place, and it turned up that I circled all around, the, I could have thrown a stone at the guy's front door, or at the back door, or you know, at, at where he lived. Hardly anybody lives in homes, they live in apartments, you know. And... Um, and, and I wasn't finding the street. But with the things of God, flesh will never find God's highest for any one person's life. It can't happen. We need the Holy Ghost. We need the revelation of God. It, it, it's, it's, it's so huge. We're returning to, um, where were we returning to? Anybody remember? 1 John 3.21. And it says, see I quote some of these things in Estonian, but you wouldn't understand. And it says here, it says that um, beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. In verse 22, and whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Amen. That's faith. Boldness is a strong kind of faith. Boldness is faith. To live out what we have. Let's turn for a moment to a very familiar passage before we turn even to a more familiar. We're going to go to Mark 11, 20, Mark 11 today. Anybody ever heard of Mark 11? Brother Hagin didn't invent that chapter. We all have heard it so many times over the years, but we're going to, I believe we're going to see something, something that we might not have noticed in Mark 11. Um, Hebrews chapter 11 first. This is the great chapter of faith. Now, and it's very interesting because we were talking this morning too about with regard to faith, or with regard to uh, walking with God, there, there is a protocol. God is not our servant. We are God's servant. Modern Christianity has, has turned things around to where it's all about what God can do for us and not about what we can do for the kingdom of God because we are called to serve God. If it was the other way around, God would be serving us and we are serving ourselves. We are servants of God. And we must be servants of God. And to serve God, to serve anybody, you have to know what he wants. Yeah. You have to inquire of him. That's why David, he was a man after God's own heart, who shall fulfill, you know, who fulfilled all his will. 
Acts 13, 22. Brilliant. He, he fulfilled the will of God because he, he sought God. Nobody can fulfill the will of God without seeking God. This is why in the time of the end, there's a great falling away that has already started. Some of the people that used to share, uh, you know, you, know, you go to meetings together, or you might think of your old Bible school friends or different people that you knew that are believers. Some of them are not walking with the Lord today. Or they're so misguided that they say they're Christians, but they're really living a life. They're li it's all about how they can satisfy their, their own self. They're serving themselves. They're not serving the Lord. There are idols in their life. See, some, we, we get tripped up because idol, you know, if you go to Asia, you have a little Buddha statue that's just with a suction cup. It's on a dashboard. It's not a bobblehead that just bobbles there on the dashboard, but it's just stuck there. It looks so funny. You got these little Buddha statues on a dashboard. And we're thinking idols in terms of something, some kind of an icon that we bow down to. But, you know, um, <clears throat> Brother Hagin used to always say that the two main uh, dominating or, or the, the dominating spirits in any society creep into the church if they're not careful. The two main spirits in the world today are humanism and lawlessness. And in the time of the end, lawlessness increases, and that's why it says, and the love of many shall grow cold. Why? Because lawlessness causes God to back off and cause people, causes people to live self-willed without fear of God. And when that happens, God backs off and the devil is loosed. And we need the power of God to sustain and keep and build things properly. Without the power of God present, everything collapses and, 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 and basically it'll fall into the systems of man. It'll be just like the days of Jeremiah where they hewed cisterns for themselves that couldn't hold God. They committed two sins. They forsook God, the living source, and they hewed for themselves cisterns that cannot hold water. People are doing that today. They're coming up with systems of what it means to walk with God, of what it means to, 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 to do church. And God is not in the center of it. Again, like we're talking about this morning, the, the Abraham, the first time worship is mentioned in the Bible, it is in, is in connection with great sacrifice. So even in Hebrews 13, we bring the sacrifice of praise. See, we're, we're, we're so used to it. It's become like quick ditties. We bring the sacrifice of praise. We don't even stop to think that sacrifice is sacrifice. It's not convenient. It's something we do. We, we, we set apart to honor God, to give unto God. Amen. Sacrifice is not always pleasant. It's not always easy on the flesh. And Abraham did not go up to the mountain with a musical instrument. There are times when we talk about, when we talk about protocol before God, there is a time in the presence of God where God comes down so much that it almost becomes unfitting and ultimately does become unfitting to even utter a breath. I told our drummer one time, I said, I said, you'd be very sensitive to your spirit. This is not a jam session, this is not a rock band. When God shows up, it's time to ease off on some things. When he shows up powerfully. Yeah. Because if you just go hog wild, you know, and, and I mean, God shows up and he expects the hearts of men to bow. There comes a time. I remember one time, one time, I mean, it, it was so, the presence of God, I mean, has come into our church many times. We've had some unusual experiences before the Lord. With angelic voices and instruments. And I remember one time, the people playing the instruments could no longer play because the, 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 the presence of, of God, it was so thick in the hall that it was everybody just dropped to their knees. Who on their face, who on their knees. It was just like unfitting to just sit there, much less to stand there and chew gum. You, you, you following me? Yeah. Because when Almighty God shows up, our hearts must bow. Yeah. We, 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 we need to learn to do this in a, in a corporate setting like this, but at home too, God will advance on some of us and he will, he will advance to see how how we treat that advance. It's maybe a, 
a shallow illustration. Nonetheless, in a type and a shadow sense, in a little bit, there's a, there's a truth there, and I, I'll, 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 I'll just risk it and say it anyway. If, if a man, a husband, makes an advance on the wife and is always blown off, he will stop making the advance. This is not birds and the bees class. But you know what I'm, you know what I'm and, and, and there's, there's something about God. He, he wants to see how we respond to him. Are we going to respond to him? And I remember that one time, <clears throat> people just stopped playing. And you know what? People stopped playing, and yet the music went on. The music went on, and it was more intense than ever, and nobody was touching an instrument. And people were weeping before the Lord, repenting before the Lord, getting their lives straight. We need the presence of God. Yeah. I talked with a man of God years ago that, you know, they, I mean, there are entire towns and villages saved on one of the islands of the Pacific, a big island, New Guinea, one of the last vestiges of headhunting. We're not talking corporate headhunting. We're talking about eating human flesh headhunting. And... Uh, Brutal place. When, when the revival first broke out, there were mercenaries sent to basically kill these guys. One, one, you know, and these testimonies are well documented. Well, I mean, I, I know many of the people involved personally. One guy put a, put a gun up to, up to the guy's head, and then the man of God just said, this shall be like a toy gun, it shall not hurt me. You never notice Jesus walked through their midst? Yeah. You can't just walk out of the midst of trouble unless you know God. Unless you know that what you are called to do, you are called to finish. There is a finishing mentality that must come to the body of Christ, but it's predicated upon the understanding that we are sent ones. But if we are sent ones, we are sent to do something and to finish it. And God himself will make sure that we do. Yeah. Yeah. If we give ourselves to him. Yeah. Nothing can stop us. Nothing. Yeah. Nothing. Nothing. Jesus has walked through the midst. So a man of God from Sweden one time went to, he was, he was in Armenia, and, and, and some of these guys, I mean, they got stockpiles of automatic weapons, and there was a whole outfit that was just ready to mow the guy down after, after a meeting. They had a really great meeting, the power of God shows up, and he's looking at this, everybody's cleared out, and he sees that all these, all these big Mercedes are still in front of the building, and these guys are just waiting. Big skinhead, big thugs. It's hard to find a tall Armenian. <laughs> But they got the big ones and the tough ones. And they're waiting, armed. They got knives to cut the fingers off and guns to, to, to do whatever else needs done. And they're waiting for him. And he's getting real nervous. In the flesh, he's saying, Lord, you know, I mean, is this, it? Is, is, this, is this really the end of the race? I know it's not. And all of a sudden, it came to him. Jesus walked through their midst. And he goes, that's it. I also shall walk through their midst. Yeah. So he prayed, musters up some boldness. It's just like some things have to be done. It just has to be done. I'll get to the finishing of that story. I've got different windows open, you see. <laughs> I was talking about this you know, at, the, at the end of this one meeting. This kid was playing on the platform, high platform. And I remember, I remember, I remember seeing it, and I'm going, I'm going... It still freaks me out thinking about it. Because this young kid, maybe three, maybe four, maybe uh, somewhere, maybe four, I'd, I'd say four, falls off a height this big and falls like this right on his head on a concrete floor. And I hear the sound, and after that is lifeless. He, he's just like, I mean, he's, he's on the ground, there's nothing moving. All of us have ebbs and flows with a relationship with God. At a weak moment, the first instinct is called the ambulance. On a strong moment, the first imp impulse is, God, you have to do something now. Yeah, yeah. I remember being in an accident. I'll, I'll finish this story. I started it twice. I'll finish it. But I was in a car wreck. I was six days old in the Lord. It shows that you don't have to be old in God to do certain things. You have to be desperate. Not just desperate. But you have to be 
you have to be like a bulldog. I'm taking this, and there's no, just no two ways about yeah. this. Yeah. Faith, see, faith is not an experiment, you see. Right. Faith is a being convinced of those things which you do not yet see. There's no wishy-washiness about it. It's not a wave that goes back and forth. It just takes, and that's all there is to it. There's no plan B. And I remember six days old in the Lord, I got in a car wreck with a young lady. We were hit broadside by a drunk driver. We were driving probably, we're talking about these cars, these Russian cars. This is even smaller. Do you remember the old Honda Civics that you could basically put your fist through the door? A little, like, a, but the size of an Austin Mini? The old Austin Minis. Yeah. I mean, you could, you, could, you could seriously dent the car with a fist if you didn't, you know. The thing was just, and a car drives into us going about 45 miles an hour, a, a much bigger car. And, and I was out. When I came to, my head hits this donut steering wheel. I was only 19 years old. And I look, and beside me, this girl, we just came from a Bible study, this girl was covered in blood from head to foot. Her white blouse was red because her, her hips were crushed into a space this wide. We have a photo showing what happened. The door was here and the center console was here. Her hips were crushed into that space. I feel her pulse. There wasn't any. I don't know how long I was out. I have no idea. But I had, there was no pulse there for approximately half a minute. I don't know, all I knew, my, my first instinct was, Lord, this cannot be, we, I, I don't receive this, I, I cannot, this cannot be, Lord, you have to do something here. A little bit in the back of my mind, the thought, fleeting thought is this, this, this girl's parents will kill me, they're unsaved. But that wasn't the, the big issue. And I was holding on to her and all of a sudden the pulse came. I have no idea how long we're, I didn't know how long I was out. I don't know why I'm going this way, but there's a place in God. We have to know God to walk in certain things. But, but here, even to say that you don't have to be old, you just, you just have to be locked into God. I knew my first six days of the Lord. I mean, I could hardly do anything. I mean, my, my longing when I got home from work was just to run in and just get with the Lord. It's like on a Sunday night. Most people aren't longing to get with the Lord. They're, they're looking for an out. Not everybody shows up for a Sunday night service. You know, most churches don't even have a Sunday night service anymore. Why? It's because other things are greater desires. They're not seeking God first. They're doing their duty Sunday morning, and, and you know, I've done my duty for the week. Now I get on with my real life, and I'll show up next week. And um, this girl, I was, I was just young. I didn't know anything about faith, really. Not, not versed in faith. This girl, she was unconscious, but speaking in tongues. Totally unconscious. I'd never heard anybody speak in tongues other than that one prayer meeting that we went to. I, was, I, I got saved in a Baptist church. At the hospital, when she finally comes to probably six hours later, or maybe, maybe five, four and a half, five hours later, the first words out of her mouth is, I don't receive this. I don't receive this. And I'm thinking, what? I never heard words like that. I don't receive this. I claim my healing. And I'm thinking, what? Doctor said that she probably won't live till sunrise. When she did, then they say, well, I don't know how she's lived till sunrise, but she's not going to live. She's not going to, she, she, she'll never be normal if she stays alive. She'll be in a wheelchair all of her life, an invalid. She kept on saying, I don't receive this. I don't receive this. I claim my healing. I thank you, Lord, for my healing. Lord. And uh, it was amazing because the docs finally said, well, she won't be a vegetable, but she'll never walk. And she kept on saying the same thing with her testimony. You never say, 
I'm two-thirds well, hallelujah. Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 because then the devil just comes with new symptoms and you're, you're back to square one. You don't go by that. You go by this, the written word that basically has decreed what God has, has, has basically given you, and that's what you take, nothing else. Long story short, one year later, she was running, jumping, hiking, bicycling, swimming, and doing Estonian folk dance. It's, it's not really an unsanctified thing, but I mean, that just shows that, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a pretty, like a polka and all this, you know. She, 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 she was basically, she, she's lived a normal life because God stepped in. This young child, all, all I need to do, I, I don't know what I was going to do. I just, I just ran, and I didn't even think about Paul. I just landed on this, on this child, and I said, Lord, you have to come through for this child in the name of Jesus. Let it be as if this fall didn't take place. Because there was, there was just basically, it was, it was like life lives. There was, there was no movement. I didn't even check for a pulse. I didn't even have time to think that way. But there was just no movement. And all of a sudden... Just, this child starts squirming under me. It went from lifeless to squirming under me as if, well, you get off me, you big old. <laughs> and and, and, I, and I, I backed off. And he, he just jumped up and ran away as if nothing happened. Glory. I mean, God must be in our midst. But we're, we're talking about maybe isolated situations, you know, where, where you really need God to show up in a, in a big way. But we need God to show up just to not go apostate. Churches that have a, a low level of the presence of God will soon not be on the map. The, they, they will already drift apart from the will of God and from the word of God like so many of them are doing. Well, we don't want to have this prayer in the church. We don't want to have tongues in the church. We don't want to have anything that confronts it. Well, how can you be involved in the kingdom of God and not confront? Everything about light confronts dark. Your life is an affront to darkness. It scares the devil. And it sort of causes at least a measure of uncomfortableness or discomfort in, in those unsaved relatives of yours that, that you know, you're, you're wanting them to so understand you. But it says that the unregenerate man does not understand the things of the Spirit. So stop trying. Yeah. Live out your life and have fun and let him cope with it. Yeah. I'm being cute about it. But asking God to come down and God to convince them and God to reveal to them different things instead of us trying to be so like them, boldly live out. That's why Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why did he say, I mean, how, how would you be ashamed of God? But there's a, a spirit in this world that would cause you to feel shame, siding with God. Anyway, I'm not going to get ahead of myself. Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, and we see here, because when we're talking about the presence of God, we must seek God. We read in, a, in, in, in one place in the Bible, and there's, the principle is overriding. You see it everywhere in the whole book, all through the scriptures. But you, there's the one well-known passage, Jeremiah 29, where it says, And you shall seek me and find me when you search me with all your heart. Anybody know that passage? Because my plans for you are good and not evil. But you shall find me when you seek for me and search me with all your heart. Now, this is interesting because, now, you might, you might think that, well, you know, that, that, was, that was Old Testament. We, we right now, we, we have a relationship with God. Yeah, we do. That's why Hebrews says, come boldly before the throne of grace to obtain. Let's all say to obtain. Amen. So there are things to get from the throne of grace. You can be, you can have position of right standing. But unless you come, you, you know, this is New Testament. It says you have not because you ask not. God knows before what you need, before you pray. I pray you therefore like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. God knows, yeah, but all, all prayer would be a waste of time if things came automatically. But God expects us to prove to him that we put the kingdom first, and that we 
put him first. There are no other idols. God is number one. The, the coming together in the name of God's kingdom and the establishment of God's word and his power and presence multiplied in us as we corporately come together. One puts a thousand to flight, two puts ten thousand to flight. As we come together like this, the power of God will start bringing us from freedom to freedom, from faith to faith, grace to grace, and glory to glory. Hebrews chapter 11, it says here, verse 5, now this, this again, this is given to us now. See again, in some of this erroneous teaching, it says, well, Jesus, he operated in the Old Testament, and it was still Old Testament time. Yes, but Jesus operated as a prototype, as a son, and what you can do with a connection to God as a son, he operated as a prototype. And that's why he said, go into all the world, preach the gospel to all creation. And it says, it says, making disciples of all nations, teaching them to what? To obey all things that I have commanded you. So what are we teaching? The words of Jesus. And that's what Paul was doing. We can't say, oh, well, Jesus' teaching, that's one thing, but well, now nah, we're, we're, just, we're just around with Paul and, and, and Jesus, well, that was old, and that no longer belongs. No, 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 no. Because it's the image of Christ that's being formed in us. Are you, are you here with me? Yeah. But some people are, are dividing, dissecting, vivisecting, all this, and, and basically, well, this doesn't mean this, and this doesn't belong to you, and this doesn't belong to you, and pretty soon nothing belongs to you, and nothing means anything, because it's, you know what I mean? That's the spirit of... That's the spirit of, of, of theology that is, as it's portrayed and taught in, in a lot of places. Well, you can't interpret it this way. This doesn't quite mean this, and this word doesn't mean that, and that doesn't mean that. And, and pretty soon, nothing means anything, and we can't stand on the word because everything's being shaken. And people that get that type of an education, many of them never recover because the spirit of unbelief has so entwined itself in the person that they have a hard time standing. If you've come out of that kind of a background, if you seek God, God's water and God's power can cleanse any of us from anything. His power is greater than all, but it has to be accessed. And so here, it's saying here, um, by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death because, and was not found because God had translated him, for before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. So here we see, we see the scriptures talking about the fact that, that we should want to please God. How many times does it say in the New Testament, living a life unto all pleasing? I mean, that scripture or that concept is brought out many, many, many times. So the people say that, 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 that talk, that everything's automatic, we don't have to, you know, even obedience becomes uh, like tantamount or, or equal to, to getting into works. To stir ourselves up is, is now we're, we're in works. No, 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 no. It's obedience. Obedience and works are two different things. See, hold your place here for a minute. Paul, when he was talking in, in Romans chapter 1, he's talking about his apostolic call. And, you know, we, we can... Okay, let's say verse, verse 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. Paul sees himself, number one, as a servant. Number two, the ministry given to him. But you see, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto. Let's all say separated unto. Separated. See, and that's an act of, of our will to separate ourselves unto. That's what the word holy means, kadosh in Hebrew. It means separated unto God and separated away from the things that defile. It's a separation. So he goes on to say, which he had promised before by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Let's just say Holy Scriptures. Holy. See, it's, the, the Holy Ghost is a Holy Spirit. The Scriptures are Holy Scriptures. The call is a Holy call. Are you here? Holiness must be loved. It's not a dirty word. Amen. Holiness is not works. Holiness is devotion to God. Works is only if we are depending on our works and deeds to gain brownie points with God. And we don't depend and rely on the blood. Are you here? But people get into, into a ditch on some of these kind of things. And they think that, well, and it goes on to say here, 
verse 4, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we've received grace and apostleship for obedience. What's the grace for? Obedience. Uh, what's the apostleship for? Obedience. The ministry gifts are to produce obedience. Grace is to produce obedience. That's just what we concluded with this morning, didn't we? The grace of God teaches us. And all the things that we read this morning, the whole list of things, everything from obedience to, to living holy lives to, to, to zealously wanting to do His will, that's what grace teaches us to do. But grace can be, it can be, it can be emphasized in a way where it's actually been contaminated by a spirit of lawlessness. Do you know that the Antichrist is the lawless one? And, and before the Antichrist shows up, the Bible says in 1 John that the spirit of the Antichrist already operates. Even before the man shows up, the spirit operates, and, and the devil himself is lawless. The Antichrist is the lawless one. And anything to do with the standards of God gets maligned. That's why the, that's why the uh, Antichrist, he comes to change the times and the seasons. He's already started. That's why all the fuss about what is a family, what is a marriage. Is it Adam and Eve or is it Adam and Steve? Because it's a rewriting. It's the changing of the laws, the times and the seasons. That's what Daniel 11 talks about. When talking about the work of the Antichrist and what he's all about. And we see that spirit trying to, trying to knock the whole Judeo-Christian foundation for, 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 for legislation, for, for law, laws and things, and knock that all up to where we have no absolute anymore. Why? Because then we can do what we want the way we want it. It's the spirit of humanism, and again, but it's also the spirit of lawlessness. You want to see something else interesting? Psalm 2. Hold your place where you are. Psalm 2, it starts by saying, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The word imagine also means meditate. Why do they meditate a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together. Sounds like the United Nations. What are they doing? They're, 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 they set themselves, they're taking counsel together against the Lord, against his anointed, saying, what are they saying? Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Let's cast away the restraints. Let's cast away the words that say that this is an absolute, this is sin and this is not. Let's cast those things away that we can do what, our, what we want and conscience won't be an issue. Because there are no absolutes. That's what they're wanting to produce. That's the age we live in. It's that, that spirit is conniving. And all these things are going toward a future to where it will become illegal to say this is an absolute. Especially if it confronts the ideology of humanism that says let's do what we want, how we want it, as long as it feels good. Are you here? Now the fact that these things are taking place shows us that we're in a time of the end, but there is an answer. God will get the last laugh. In fact, we see it right here. I didn't even think of it this, but he actually says it right here. He says, let us break their bands asunder. Let us cast away their cords. Let us cast away the restraint. This is a manifestation of lawlessness. All moral restraints of the word of God cannot stay according to what they declare. That's why so many Christian things and so many... Anyway, I'm not going to go in that direction. I could stay there. That's not my topic tonight. But it says, he that sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. He shall speak unto them in his wrath and vex or trouble them. Sore displeasure is really sleepy because it says, it's basically intense anger is the word in Hebrews. He's angry. But he's also, he also realizes that the plans... Of, of, of man are futile. In, in Isaiah it says that all the, drop, all, the, all the nations on earth are as a drop in a bucket before him. They're even less than dust on the scales. 
This is the God we serve. We never need to be afraid. We can walk through their midst. I started mentioning about this guy. He, he finally says, I'm, I'm just going to walk through their midst. And he says, in the name of Jesus, I'm just going to go out there and I will walk through their midst. And so he walks out the front door and these guys are waiting for him. And as he walks out the door, something comes over those guys to where they all back off. And it's like the parting of the Red Sea. You're thinking, what happened? They don't even know what happened. God caused them to back off. How did he do that? We don't know, but God's God. And he caused them to back off. And he just marched right through their midst, just like this. Just walked right through their midst. I, I know this man personally. He was telling us personally this, this, this testimony. And this is, there's a lot of people around you know, that, that, that were there at that particular situation, too. I wasn't there. So the story is well known. He walked through the midst. God can do it. So he gets the last laugh. And verse 6 says, Yet I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. So you guys can fuss. Estonians have a funny, they have a funny, uh, they have a funny saying. It says, the dogs can bark, but the caravan will move on anyway. <laughs> you know, I don't know if that tells you anything. I mean, it, it's almost, you almost get a, almost like a bunch of nomads in the desert. Are you here? Hebrews 11. Now, did I leave any other little stories un untold? Did I leave any other windows open? Huh? You think that was the last one? See, see, this is good. So you guys are helping me preach. This is corporate anointing here tonight. <laughs> so, so Hebrews 11, verse, verse, verse 6. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. Huh, very interesting. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. But what kind of faith is he talking about? See, God loves everybody but not everybody's lifestyle pleases God. And this is not just Old Testament, this is New Testament. And he goes on to say, but without faith it's impossible to please him, for he that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. What kind of faith are we talking about? The kind of faith that seeks God and knows that God will come through, he'll reward that. Are we doing it for brownie points? No, we're doing it because we honor God and we want God's kingdom first. We're seeking first. See again, seek first the kingdom of God. So there is a seeking that's holy. There is a seeking that's correct. Without which, we cannot come into certain, access certain things. I was talking with that man from New Guinea. And, uh, you know, because <clears throat> entire towns and villages were saved. There's, there's meetings <clears throat> uh, and, and like documented cases, you know, like, uh, I remember hearing one story of a Wednesday night meeting where all, you know, all kinds of people gathered. You know, the, the children were already there worshiping God. They're worshiping God at 3, 4 o'clock after they get off school, and getting ready for a Wednesday night meeting. Wow. Adults, the ones that could, would show up already at 6 o'clock, and they'd be, they'd be seeking the Lord. They'd be worshiping God. They'd be, they'd be crying out to the Lord for God to do things. They'd be interceding for different ones that need help. And, uh, and by the time the meeting officially started, I mean, they'd be walking right. Uh, the glory was already, uh, the presence of God so strong. And there's times where, where every sick person in the house was just healed, just, just like without anybody even touching them. Blind eyes, deaf ears, limbs that didn't exist, and limbs that didn't even exist in some cases. Or did I, what did I say? Did I say that twice? Yeah, limbs that, limbs that were, were, were dysfunctional or that didn't even exist. God just showed up. And I remember asking this man, and this man was so humble, he could have, he could have, he could have marketed himself and been on the front of the cover of the Rolling Stone, I mean the, the Charisma magazine. Freudian slip. <laughs> See, some people are waiting to market themselves, and God, anybody that wants to market the anointing, God's going to back off them. He may use them, but he's not going to use them for the real special things. That's why time has elapsed since the original prophecies some of the original prophecies have come out, even, not even just in the 70s and 80s, but going back even further. God is waiting to see who means business with him. Are we going to seek him, or are we just going to use him like all the others? Are we going to love him, or are we going to just be like all the others that just use him? You know, how many people have, 
have, have made pledges to God while in trouble in the open sea. There's been so many promises made to God. If you get me out of this, I'll serve you forever. And the moment they get to shore, then everything's forgotten. That's the way of the flesh. But God wants for his presence to come. But it doesn't come cheap. When there's other things in the way. See, that's why I was saying, even in the beginning of the meeting, there are times I believe God will see how much we mean business. I remember one experience I had with the Lord uh, and it was, it was one of the, one of the first, ex it was among, you know, one of the first things that, uh, that I really, like a, like a real strong experience. And I remember the Lord saying, he says, he says, this wouldn't have happened tonight unless you, unless you, you uh, uh, if you had a, uh, because you gave me this period of time without a back end on the schedule. So sometimes we'll say, well, Lord, I'll give you 20 minutes, and then I've got to go. And the Lord says, oh, <laughs> All right, you got 20 minutes, and all right. And the Lord will bless that 20 minutes. He knows if we've got to go to work. He knows if we've promised something, we've got to be something. That's just different. But sometimes we, 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 have this, we have this microwave mentality to where we're not ready to sacrifice anything to get to know God. And there are times, I believe, in the times to come, in churches too, where God will see who wants. It's just again, like we're talking, if he advances, what are we going to do with that advance? Are we, going to, are we going to sort of play along with the advance until it's time to go to the next order of service or until it's time to go home? Because look, it's 1230. Because if the clock puts everything into place, some things we will never get. Yeah. I started talking about Paul preaching. I don't know what would have happened if the young guy fell out of the window earlier. I, you know, we don't know, but all, all we do know is Paul continued talking to sundown, and I'm not going to do that tonight. <laughs> you know, I really uh, don't have any intention. Ministered till sundown. Then they ate, and they dispersed, and they were filled. We have to want God. We have to receive from God. We have to, we have to come. It's like the old expression. We have, to, we, have to, we have to come out. We have to come to the spout where the glory comes out. I mean, you can create that at home. And you can make sure that it is when we come together corporately. By, by just saying. I, I, remember, I remember times too, even in, in the youth. You know, we come to, you know, Wednesday night service. We're just freshly saved. We didn't, we didn't like know any better. We didn't know that we had to just sort of pace ourselves. We're just so hungry for God, we fasted and prayed for a Wednesday night meeting. Even as a, even as a pastor, it's rare to fast for a Wednesday night meeting anymore. And I guess all I have to do is just slap my wrist. See, we get into roots and patterns a lot. But I remember at that time, I was together with a, another hungry believer. We're just so hungry, we just had to be touched by God. We're just so hungry. We, we fast and prayed. We, you know, I mean, we happened to have the day off school anyway, and, and it was break or something, and, and we just prayed and prayed and, 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 and just worshiped God. And I'm, not, I'm, not talking, I'm not talking here about earning something by works. We're not talking about this. It might sound almost like this, but I'm not talking about this. I'm talking the desire. The desire. The desire can be there with a five-minute prayer, and that's more powerful than just basically going through the motions and, and, and just, you know, fly, you know, just, you know, whipping yourself, and I'm, you know, bless God, I'm going to stay on my knees until I, I get some calluses here, and I'm going to be here for two hours a day all week, bless God, you know, and then God has to come through. No, 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 no. You know, all you're going to get is callus. Yeah. Probably get a calloused heart on top of the callous knees. Yeah. I asked this guy from New Guinea, and he was so humble, when I asked him, you know, just tears welled up, because just at the thought of what the Lord had done, just tears welled up. And I'd, I'd, I've, I'd known him for a period of time, and he wouldn't talk about these things. He could have marketed himself. He was such a simple man. <clears throat> the way he was dressed, I figured he was a janitor in some church. He wasn't even a minister. It was like a meeting where there's a, a mixture of people attending. And, uh, you know, he didn't look like any, he didn't wear fancy shoes, didn't have a tie, didn't, didn't, I mean, he was real simple. Some guys in New Guinea weren't even that simple. But he was. And, um, and he looked, you know, I, I said, tell me about those Wednesday night, that Wednesday night meeting. 
And he was just going, like, what Wednesday night meeting? The, the Wednesday night meeting when this and this, he's, you know, and tears well up again. He, he says, you know, that happened many times. And entire towns. Coming to the Lord. And I asked him, I said, you know, okay, I've, I've heard about the miracles. I, 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 could, I could hear more. I love hearing about the miracles. But I want to know how did it start? What created this? He said, his, his instinct, knee-jerk reaction was prayer. He says, he says, prayer. no, 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 wait, wait, wait. I've got to back up. It didn't start with prayer. It started with hunger. But prayer followed right along that, the heels of that hunger. We wanted it. We wanted God to move. Have you ever wondered why certain, even, even in recent times, the prayer might, or the, the revival might not last long? Sometimes it's sort of hijacked by somebody's, somebody's image. It's hijacked by, you know, that they get their name too much on it and God backs off or wrong doctrine comes in. There's been plenty of revivals even in the last century, even in recent times, but they don't last long. And, and it troubles sometimes because a lot of these, they haven't come to areas that are even have as good teaching as many of our churches. Have you ever noticed that? They don't know about, you know, you know the, a lot of the simple, basic doctrines, the word of faith and everything like that. But I tell you what, there's a difference. If, if, if a person is hungry for God, and they may know less, but what they know they're trying to put into practice, and they're hungry for God, that'll go farther than knowing everything and doing some yeah. with a casualness. And this man, he said, he said that, he said that, um, that hunger changed a lot of things. See, why am I talking like this? You're hungry enough to be here on a Sunday night. So in a sense, I could have, if, if, I, was, if I was directing this at you, I would, have, I would have spoke this in the morning. I mean, I mean I, honestly, I, I'm not, I, I didn't even know I'd go in this direction right now. I, I, I had sort of an outline, but I'm not even, not even so much even on it. In fact, all this, 80% of this is sort of like, wow, I didn't know I'd say this. But I believe, because of the integrity of the man of God and the woman of God that have, that have pushed through hard times, that if, if we rise up stronger than ever, wanting God to move, we're going to come in to the best days that we have ever known despite what is going on, and maybe even especially because of what is going on outside. I started talking about the lawlessness. A lot of people are going in the direction. Lawless, lawless to the point where, 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 let's say, in the beginning, you know, the manifestation of humanism in the church. Humanism, we don't, we don't want God to just show up and do... We don't, want, we don't want people to be uncomfortable. We want them to, to feel warm and fuzzy in the presence of God, you know, just, just like, like, like they belong. Do you know a sinner will never belong or feel like they belong? They'll be confronted with something. The gospel is an offense in a direct, you know, and if they're really hungry, they'll go past that offense and they will get something from God. The ones that choose to stumble, they'll stumble anyways. talking this morning about Ezekiel. How'd you like to have a ministry? God told them ahead of time, you're going to preach to them. But I'll tell you right now, they're stiff-necked. They're not going to listen to what you say. Go. I send you in the midst of them. <laughs> and we see even in the New Testament, it talks about even ones that don't receive, it'll be as a testimony unto them. They can never say they didn't hear. These are very sober times because, because the spirit of the age is very much infiltrated. Let's go, let's go now to Mark. We've got we to get there. So he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. A person that doesn't express faith by diligently seeking God cannot fully come into a place of pleasing the Lord as, as he wants. We're designed for it. We're designed to walk through. Mark 11. And uh, I won't necessarily read all the details. But um, just, just to recount the situation, Jesus came and surveyed the temple. He surveyed the temple, and he saw what was going on in there. Some people think that his anger, just, he just lost it, 
And he just took a whip and just started basically, he, he just basically lost it, came unglued and just started kicking over tables. And, you know, it would have been quite a sight. If we see in the, in the, in the millennium, I mean, we've got video, we've got all these things these days. I believe God has, has, has made, we'll be able to see in past generations what happened. I honestly believe that. You'll be able to see how, how exactly did Luther uh, fare in the next two weeks. You'll, you'll see in detail, plus the, you know, I mean, God's going to show these things. If he recorded the details as he did, again, about who put the post in place, who restored this and who did this, believe you me, he will record who helps with the children, who sets the chairs in order, who deals with the sound booth, who deals with every kind of thing, including the things that nobody sees. Yeah. Without question, it's being recorded. But I believe it says in Malachi that he records those that talk of him often. Can you imagine that? That's being recorded too. When you talk of the Lord, that's been that's, that's recorded. Interesting scripture. I, I like the scripture. I like talking about the Lord. And um, where was I? Uh, hmm, let's re rewind this. Yeah, he was surveying the temple. He looked at this. He was surveying the temple. He sees what's going on, and then he retreats, and they go up to Bethany for the night. Okay, so now he's, he's in Bethany for the night. <clears throat> in the meantime, he curses a fig tree. All the green people would get upset. Why did Jesus curse the, you know, that, that, that poor tree? I tell you what, if he can teach his children faith through a tree, I mean, we chop down a tree to throw it in the fireplace to get warmth. We chop down a tree so we can build, put siding on a house or on a rec room. How much more is having it as an object lesson to teach faith to somebody? I mean, my goodness. The fact that figs were, were not, I mean, that wasn't the issue. He wasn't, he wasn't angry that there were no figs there. He wanted to just show. That's why if you, if you go here, and, and uh, verse, verse 20, um, it says here, they saw the fig dried up from the roots. And Peter calling, verse 21, to remember, it saying unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursest is, is withered away. It's like, wow, look at this. Look at this, Master. And Jesus answering, saith unto them, have faith in God. Have faith in God. Peter, I mean, Jesus, you cursed the fig tree, it dried up, and now you're saying about that, just have faith in God. But it goes on, and it says, For verily I say unto you, whosoever shall say unto. In other words, faith in God will seek him, but faith in God will say unto. Verse 24, about the saying unto, because we can say, you know, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, shall it doubt in his heart, shall believe that those things shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he says. Therefore, I say unto you, whatsoever you ask for in prayer, whatsoever your desire in prayer. See, that's prayer. We've, we've heard this. Your pastors taught that. We've, we've, we sort of cut our, our teeth on this kind of teaching. This is prayer. Speaking, having faith in God, we are meant to operate as kings and priests. How does a king priest, or how does a king rule? With a hammer? We are just talking over lunch about how the Russians uh, over in the Soviet system, they fixed everything with a hammer. If the TV set wouldn't come on properly, out comes the hammer, boom. <laughs> if the car wouldn't start, boom. You know, if the, if the door you know, in the kitchen cupboard was crooked, you know, out comes the hammer. There's, 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 there's no finesse involved. There's just only one. The, the hammer was always on the side of the belt. <laughs> but a king rules by speaking. But we rule through Christ. But now, what happens? Jesus, he says, whatever I've seen in my father, that shall I do. He didn't just arbitrarily just do anything, just in everything. He, he, he had a sense of what needed done. He goes to Bethany, Bethany, he prays, and when he comes back to the temple, he already has the whip made. So he's praying as he's, he either bought it or made it or whatever, but he comes with a whip the next day. And he drives out those in the temple. He kicks over the tables. You can, you can just imagine the fiasco. Dove's feathers flying, dust in the air, tables falling. You know, one guy trying to come through, Jesus, he stopped them. He wouldn't allow them to come through. I mean, this, this, I mean, this is a wild scenario. Jesus got more boldness than John Wayne. Or Rambo. Or, huh? Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, you know, he wouldn't allow it. And then, check this out. Look what he says. 
he says here, he, okay, verse 16, he would not allow or suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. And he taught, saying unto them, is it not written, my house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer. But you have made it a den of thieves. Now, most of the time when we're thinking you've made it a den of thieves, we're thinking automatically that these guys in their greed, they're charging too much for the duff. You know, Walmart's price is this, but he's charging 50% more for the dove. He's ripping the people off, or the, these, these, these scribes. You know what the thievery really is? The thievery is that the purpose of the temple was hijacked to be something other than it was designed to be. It was designed to be a house of prayer. And that's why in this generation that we live, they're the Antichrist spirit again, also of humanism. Humanism says you, you gotta be, you, you can't confront people, you, got, you can't challenge people because, because they, they won't want to come if they're challenged. Jesus, look at the cross section of what he taught. Look at the cross section of what Paul taught. If, if you take every challenge from Paul's mouth, every challenge from Jesus' mouth, and underline it with a certain color, I guarantee you, I don't care where you are in the, in the New Testament, you're going to have an awful lot of that color. I did it. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, you know, I, I didn't realize. And yet, if somebody was preaching what Paul preached today, or what Jesus preached today, they'd be accused of being controlling, they'd be accused of using scare tactics, they'd be accused of being, you know, in, in your face and stuff like that. And you're thinking, dear Lord, why is that presence, why did Paul say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel? Why is that, is that in the air? It's because the devil wants to shut the body of Christ up to where things don't come out. Are you here? We're designed to be a house of prayer. We are ordained to be a house of prayer. The hijacking of purpose. Turn with me to Mark, I mean to, to uh, 1 Corinthians 12. You know, there's, 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 no, there's no way to logically stop a message like this. Because it, it just keeps coming. We'll just have to jump off the train at some point. And roll. And roll. <laughs> I believe as we... see. So sometimes you don't have to understand everything you're hearing from the Word, of, you know, but as you're reading it, there's, there's a cleansing taking place. There's, a, there's, a re there's a, like a, a restructuring or, or, or cor correction that takes place as, as you read the Word and as, as, you, as you hear the Word preached. And um, the word reformation actually means, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a word that actually means like a, like a, like a almost like you'd put the, 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 boin, the, 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 um, the bones of a backbone in, in order, in line. You're just like, uh, you know, I don't want to bore you with Greek words because I don't think they're, you know, some people say, well, how can you understand the word without Greek? You know, Greek is flesh. You don't need Greek to understand the word of God. You need the Holy Ghost. Somebody told Brother Hagin years ago, he, you know, said, well, now that you've got a Bible school, you need, to, you need to teach Greek so you can understand it all in the original tongue. The original tongue is not as important as the original author to know him. That's right. Because he will cause you to understand. If he hides it, it's going to be hidden. If it's sealed, it's going to be hidden. If he opens it, he's, he, you're going to see it. That's why he told his disciples, do you, do, you, do, you, uh, do you still not understand? Do you still not see? What does he say? The next sentence was not, do you, do you not know Greek? No. Do you, do you not see? Do you still not understand? Are your hearts yet so hard? The hardness of the heart. This is why it's so important to, to put God so first that we, we have a hunger for God. Because in that place, we come into a new softness. This is, this is what it means to put our, our heart into a place. We, we, we bring it before the Lord and, and, and God, the water of His Spirit, will cause that softness. And we'll receive more and more and more and more and more. People that harden toward God, churches that harden toward God, you say, how do you harden toward God? You harden toward God by hardening toward His instructions. By coming up with your own. That's what humanism does. They say, well, we can't confront because, you know, people won't come unless you have the smoke machines, and they won't come unless you have a huge cappuccino bar. But see, if a cappuccino, see, I like cappuccino as much as anybody. But if cappuccino is what draws the people, it will take cappuccino to keep the people. And when the neighbor's restaurant, church, restaurant, church, whatever you want to call it, has better 
a cappuccino, then out they go because they're, they're not connected to the house by the spirit. They're connected to caffeine by cappuccino or lust or whatever it is. Are you, are you here with me? Yeah, come on. See, it's important to understand these things because, see, a lot of places are growing because a lot of people are restless right now. They're, they're very restless because what they're really needing is the water of the Spirit and, and a meaningful connection. There, and I know, I know some youth in, in a huge church outside of the United States, but a huge church. Twenty-something thousand people, and you figure, you figure, well, you know, this, you know, they've got all the perks you can imagine. They've got the most expensive building in the world, and, and you know, as far as the church is concerned, and, and, and just all the perks. But one of the elders told me, he says, you know, the youth, they're so frustrated because they're wanting something more than just to be cool for the Lord. They're hungry for reality, a, 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 an actual experience with God himself. And that's what he wants. That's what God wants. And um, 1 Corinthians 12. It's tricky because we have the perks. I don't think it's wrong to have a cappuccino bar. Maybe. But you know what? Ironically, this is really a funny, this is a funny story. Somebody, uh, my sister-in-law, who just got saved, come out of a real, come out of a real heavy drug background, Walks in the house yesterday with a book. He says, you got to check this book out. Tell me what you think of it. She's, 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 she's hungry for the Lord. Somebody gave her this book. And it's sort of got, it's, it's like one of those old, old books with a hard cover that is sort of coming off the, the you know, the binding's all messed up. You got to treat it with kid gloves. Otherwise, you know, you're, the, the, the inside pages are going to fall out of the covers. And, and I was looking at this thing and I go, wow, this is pretty interesting. It was written by you know, some guy I've never heard of. And, um, and, I was, and I was noticing, you know, it was written in 1922. And it was, it, was, it was just like uh, sermons out of the book of Isaiah or something like that. And I'm thinking, well, this is sort of interesting. I'd like to take a look. You know, I, I want to make sure that my, my sister-in-law is reading good stuff. I tell you what, there's more, generally speaking, more of the fear of the Lord 100 years ago than there is now. Yeah. You're generally safer with the older books than the newer books. That's just, that's just, an, it's just almost like a gimme. That's not to say that every new book is wrong and every old book is good because, you know, there are exceptions, but just, just in, a, in a very general st sense. So I picked this book up and I'm going, I'm going, oh my goodness, I can't believe the guy's saying this. He's, he's, saying, he's saying that we, we cannot stoop to the levels to where we, we we're filling the holy precinct with pool tables and all kinds of stuff to entertain the youth um, and, and all these perks and things because, because what they need is God and to be connected with God. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, this, this, this book is almost like he, he, he wrote it, you know, this, this, you know, decade. And he's writing these things and he's saying how we need the youth need to be connected. They need to have a relationship with God himself. If they're coming for the other things, they may never get connected with God. And sometimes you hear of a person in a place like this, you know, they, they get saved six years later in another place, ironically, because, because they, they won't preach in some of these places. They won't preach a, a confrontive message. So some of these guys, they can be unsaved in the middle of all this fluff and never actually get saved. What's going to happen with these preachers? The blood of all these people are going to be on their hands. The, 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 you know, and no revival has ever been started by a large church, ever. Read church history. Never happened. It's always happened with a nucleus that are hungry for God, that they must have God come down. And they're so serious. They're, they're, they're seeking God. They're getting their lives in, in, in order every way. Just, just like we read in 2 Corinthians 6, the tail end of it. Chapter 7, 1. And, and, and they want it. They have to have God. That, that's the stuff that all huge revivals have ever been made out of. And the interesting thing is that if we come into a place where God comes down, then we can shake a town. We can't shake a town by the whole city respecting us but not being touched by God himself. It won't happen. Jesus says, woe unto you when all men speak well of you. That's the way they treated the false prophets. What was the hallmark of the false prophets in the Old Testament? Saying, shalom, shalom, when there was no shalom. Everything's okay, peace, prosperity, just everything's great, but, but it wasn't before God. It sounds like the loud to see in church. What did Jesus say to the loud to see in church? 
This is the New Testament Jesus. Now, why am I saying this? Because I believe that we can be ready for the coming of the Lord. Scripture says, make straight the ways of the Lord. See, some things have to be made straight for the Lord. Are you here? That's what John the Baptist did. What was the first word out of his mouth? Repent. What was Jesus' first word out of his mouth? Repent. What's the first item in the milk of the word? Repent. Hebrews. Let's say, say Hebrews is the New Testament. Hebrews is the New Testament. Are you here? Yeah. And we have to understand because there's this a mishmash of things trying to cloud the issue. And certain truths are so magnified. There, there's truth there, but it's so magnified and distorted that ultimately it's like having a person's face. You, know, you can distort a person's face, you take a picture of it. But you know, if the nose is blown up the size of a watermelon, and the mouth is the size of a car, and one eye doesn't practically exist, and the second eye is like really, really tiny, and the ears are the size of peas, um, you know, and one arm is huge, and the other arm doesn't exist almost, and, the, and you know, it's just like real tiny. And, you know, how many say, uh, all the body parts are there maybe, but how many, how many would say that it's distortion, it does, it's not representative of a human being? People can do that with scriptures. They can blow one aspect so out of proportion and in so doing, they can become false, even, why, even while you can take the individual components and say, yeah, that's true, and yeah, that's true too, and yeah, that's true. But the whole picture forms a picture where a person can live for themselves and just because everything's fine and, and Jesus loves me and all my sins have been forgiven already, you know, way into the future. I never have to uh, repent again. I never do, you know, I, it goes way far away from the heart of the New Testament. What is it? Humanism. Poor old God. As if to say, poor old God, this is the 21st century. You don't know what the kids want now, you know, God. I mean, you know, we, we, we can't just... Now, I believe that the package can be streamlined. <clears throat> you know, we can you know, be a Jew to the Jew and a Greek to the Greeks. We don't, we don't have to present the gospel 1930s style where, you know, where, where the, the women are up there with a, you know, like 1930s garb. Are you here? But the message cannot be altered, and it's got to be strong. And the irony of it is, is youth want reality. They want a strong message. And a lot of older people, too, that are still youthful in heart want the same. Are you here with me? So 1 Corinthians 12, and I've got to find some way to jump off the ship here. I can insert Romans 15, verse 16, but you can do that yourself. Just write that down in your notes right now. Because we already talked this morning that the Lord himself wants that for you individually. First Thessalonians also talks about this is, you know, praying continually, continuously for this is the will of God concerning you. You know, it talks, you know, these various Romans about us being sanctified, presentable, acceptable unto the Lord, being separated or sanctified by the Holy Ghost. In other words, the Holy Ghost has so much access to us that, that he can shape us and mold us and make us to be like Christ in every way so that the final product is what the Lord is looking for. See, what's the use in having a huge church if they all look like freaks to God? Everybody living for themselves, having all kinds of idols in there. In the Old Testament, when idols were in the mid, God just backed off the temple. It was Ichabod. He left. He left Shiloh. He left these places. Places that he put his name on, he left. The temple, the holy temple that he put his name on, he left. Why? Because they put other gods before him. And that's why you can go to some of these places. They once had the presence of God. You show up now. There is no presence of God now. Some people say, oh, that was really anointed today. No, 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 no. That was a subwoofer for rattling your insides. And I'm not against subwoofers. It's just like I'm not against coffee. But, but if God disappears behind the trappings, he's in the shadow of the trappings, idolatry is taking place. I'll say it again. If God and hunger for God and worship of the true God falls, it gets somehow lost among the music and lost among the trappings, idolatry is taking place. And I hope this goes out somewhere far beyond this church because you don't need to hear it half as much as piles of churches out there. I mean, we all need to hear it. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm, not, I'm preaching to me, I'm preaching to you, I'm preaching, I'm, I'm, I'm preaching. <laughs> but we all need this. But you know, some churches, to understand that can save their life before it's too late. Because they've gone so down a path. And you know, in the future, these churches that go down that path, they will turn into clubs more and more, one by one. 
you won't find the gospel there. Less and less, there'll be different things cut out. 1 Corinthians 12, what does it say? Verse 28. And God has said some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Now, first off, you see that this is a, like a composite list. This is not, it's got aspects of the Ephesians 4 list. It's got aspects of the Romans 12 list. It's got aspects of, of, the, of the 1 Corinthians 12, what's prior to this. It, it's not, but why did he phrase it like this? Because many of these things have been issues. Nobody, nobody has an issue with a pastor existing or, or you know, a pastor is so normal. Same with, a, same with an evangelist. But before, Brother Hagin and a few others sort of broke through in the 50s, even a teacher was not really esteemed. And today, in many places, people still don't esteem or understand apostles or prophets. And there's a movement to take some of these things out of the church, to take miracles, the supernatural, out of the church, to take tongues out of the church, to take prayer out of the church. What I appreciate about you is that you'll... See, Paul says, I will, I will sing with my spirit, I will sing with my understanding. I will pray with my, with my spirit. I will pray with my understanding. Notice that the spirit is first. Because we're called to be a house of prayer. If, if those things were to be cut out or shut down just because an unsafe person walks in the building, all the devil would have to do is send a new unsafe person every week, 52 weeks out of the year, and there would be no prayer in the house of prayer. Some people say, well, how are we supposed to get him saved? Get him saved around the coffee table where he can answer the questions that they need to hear. Sunday morning, I'm not saying don't bring on saved, but I mean, you know, Sunday morning is a time where, see, that's why it says in Ephesians chapter 4, it says that God has given apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers for the training of the saints. But we, in the, largely in the Western world, we've taken as the entertaining of the saints. We're attracted to the entertainment, but we're so entertainment-minded. But if you look at even world history, before a civilization totally collapses, two things come into focus. They become highly entertainment-oriented, and homosexuality comes in. Greek empire was like that. Roman empire was like that. And people today spend more money on entertainment than food. Many people do. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Not even instead of lovers of God. Are you here? You know, I don't think I'd be the flavor of the month in a lot of places. They want to take a tomato, a few rotten ones, and... Not here. I know, not here. Thank God. Thank God. See, these are the important components to come in to the revivals. And I'll have to close somehow. <clears throat> talking southern and I'm fixing the clothes. God has set this into the church. Who is man that he should take out of the church what God puts into the church? God told God told Moses, see to it, see to it, that you build this tabernacle exactly according to specifications. David, when he talked to Solomon just before he passed on to be with the Lord, he said to Solomon, he said, he said, my son, what I've painstakingly received from God in seeking him, I now give to you. Solomon took the instructions and walked right into the glory. Yeah. That's why the, the whole Old Testament finishes with these words. It says, in, in the last days, before the great day of the Lord, talking about the spirit of Elijah in the last day of the Lord. What did Elijah do? Elijah confronted things. And he said that the hearts of the fathers would be connected to the children and the children to the fathers, lest I strike the earth with a curse. In other words, that connection has to be made. Otherwise, a curse situation will prevail. What the enemy wants to do is, is cause there to be just huge churches without any accountability, no real connection. One man of God told me, he, I said, I'm afraid for the churches in Europe. Really, and America too. <clears throat> he, he, he said this, he says, he says, many of these churches are too superficially connected to last what is coming.
Your greatest treasure is not your house, car, boat, cottage. It's your brother and sister. And we have to be strong. We have to be connected accurately with God by seeking him. We have to be connected accurately to leadership by esteeming those that God's placed and drawing off them, the hearts of the children to the fathers, fathers to the children. It's, it's talking in, in, in a figurative and in an exact way both. And also accurately connected with one another. How do we start? Oh my goodness. I mean, you know, we, we, we've hardly talked. Prayer. The house of prayer. Every revival that's come, Finney's revival, prayer caused it. The Welsh revival. It wasn't a big anything. It was a nucleus of people that got so serious, and prayer brought it. The whole nation gets saved. To the point where they come out of their cabinet meetings to pray at 1045 every morning. You know what I mean? You figure... Well, you know, they, they just must love God anyway. No, 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 no. You don't understand. Wales was dominated by, by, by two loves. Soccer and beer. And no tolerance, particularly, for anything to do with God. They were very cold. Finney, where did his... My goodness. I mean, in the spirit, he ransacked New York State. That was, that was not a hotbed, that was not a Bible buckle then, or belt, or anything else. And prayer broke through. Some people say, well, I don't know, can we do it here? My goodness, things have not hardened to that extent in the Bible belt yet. If it could happen in these kind of places, it can definitely happen in North Carolina. And every other revival, too. It's, it's all the same way. John Dowie's. You know, I, mean, I mean, you know, the, the revival back in, in Chicago in the day. I mean, prayer fueled the whole thing. Maria Eder, f prayer fueled the whole thing. And I believe as we rise to be kings and priests before God, priests to offer up to God, pleasing sacrifices, starting off giving our own bodies a living sacrifice, which is your spiritual worship. It starts there. Words are cheap unless we are on the altar too. You know? and, and, and as we do this, God himself will put more and more of his manifested presence upon us. Legally, we have everything in Christ. But the point is, that we want to access it to where our lives become supernatural as he is supernatural, that it becomes full of love and stability and power and healing as he is full of those things. Are you here? And we will be conduits, we'll be pipes for the things of God coming to a generation. I, I refuse to be a cloud without rain. I refuse. And God will do it. Humanism says we've got a better way. We, 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 we've, you know, we're going to put into the church what we want. It's, it's, it's rebellion. And then the grace teaching that declares it illegal to challenge and illegal to, to, to have people repent, it steals away the substance of a revival. It steals away the substance of a successful walk before God. It strips them into just themselves living in an ivory castle, hope, you know, basically... You know, and, and not being in a place where they can, they can please God properly. Thinking that just, you know, you know, and just quoting, it's the love of God that leads a man to repentance. You know, yeah, it's true. It's in the Bible. The context actually doesn't even, it's not even used the way we use it often. It's the context is a little bit different, but yeah, it's in the Bible. But you know what? If that was the only way, then Jesus would have never challenged anybody. He would have only talked about heaven and tried to attract people. He didn't. He scared the living daylights out of them. <laughs> Most of the Gospels is warnings. And more talk about hell by a long shot than anything about heaven. Welcome to the days of the Bible. Amen. Glory to God. Is God a God of love? Absolutely. 
that you can even distort that so out of place like some people have done. One well-known man in Tulsa, he says, well, God is love. You know, he can't send anybody to hell, so even the devil will get saved one day. No, 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 no. You, you, you have to, you'd have to void out a chunk of thing. You'd have to void out a chunk of the Bible. Look through the Bible, New Testament and Old. Jesus, I mean, even the New Testament. So how many epistles does it say, if you do this, 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 and this, you shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven? First Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, and it goes on. Hallelujah. Amen. Protocol. We need God more than ever before. Nobody will survive living in a dark world in a hostile spiritual environment without much God manifest in their lives. We need to come to receive from God and to be filled with God. Prayer, that's how we're going to do it. We have to be a house of prayer. We have to be a house, personally, of prayer. Our families must be a houses of prayer. Our church family must be houses of prayer. Protocol, faith, love, hunger. Not the kind of desperation we hear in a lot of music that, oh, God's so far off and somehow it's just so melancholy. You know the spirit of some of these songs is worse than the secular songs of 30 years ago? Because the, the spirit of secular songs 30 years ago, they, they were so influenced by the measure of the, of the water level of God in the church and just in society that they actually have a, a more of a Christian tone to them. The subject matter might be wrong, but they have a lighter feel than even some of the Christian music today, where the person that just comes right out of the nightclub is, is carrying his, you know, unregenerate baggage sometimes. He, he's just, he, he's, he's not, you know, some, some, some place, some gospel bands, you know, the, the guy's not even saved. Yeah. And they're singing about the Lord. Psalms, it says to the unsaved, how dare you take my word in your mouth like that? Wow. Read it, it's either in Psalm 52 or 3. There's a protocol. He says, those that approach me, I will show myself holy. You know, this is the stuff revival will be made out of. Some people might say, Pastor Ken, you, you, you know, it's, it's, just, it's just brought like, this is, so, this is so serious. This is like, it's brought a kind of a, a, like a sobriety or, or you know, it's this, do you know what? Sometimes we need, I challenge you, go through the New Testament afresh and God will start revealing things and it'll just jump out at you and you'll see more and more of, of the protocol of God. Sometimes there's somebody coming in, a, you know, fresh. I get people coming in sometimes and, and you know, pastors saying that, you know, I've, I've, I've said a lot of the similar things. I get people coming into our church sometimes and our leaders will come up. He goes, he goes Pastor Ken, did you hear what he said? Wow, did you hear what he just said? And I'm thinking, I'm looking at my wife and I'm going, you know, weren't they here the last month? We did a seminar on this. <laughs> Said a lot of the same things verbatim, but sometimes somebody coming in with a different way. So I don't know if my style, my, my hairdo is not as good as your pastor's. I'm not as good, as look, good a looking as your pastor. <laughs> and, um, but just... I'm coming in with, with a word that God's laid heavily on my heart for the time we live in. We need God. And I'll tell you what the good news is, he is easily found. I mean, he lives within us. Let's, 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 let's face it, he lives within us. But as we, as we desire the things of God, it's not a matter, of, it's not a matter of, of looking for God that doesn't exist and that's not in us. We're basically putting ourselves to get manifested the things that he's already given us legally. Are you here? Amen. That's really the whole issue. That's why it says, covet earnestly the gifts of the Spirit. Most of the time that happens only after the seminar on the gifts of the Spirit for 10 days. And then it's forgotten until the next seminar on the Holy Ghost gifts. Can you imagine what would happen if we longed for those gifts every day, every day, every day? Let's all stand. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.